This panel won the prize. This panel won the prize for the best title of all panels proposed and submitted. It was called Behind, it is called Behind the Green Curtain, Information Insensitivity, Information Encapsulation, and the Democratic Project of Money. Uh, and we have on the panel uh, two folks who probably need very little introduction to, the, to this group. Um, Eric Gerding is a professor and Wolf Nickel Fellow at Colorado Law. His research interests include securities, banking law, the regulation of financial markets, products and institutions, payment systems, and corporate governments. Uh, he gained this in, uh, expertise in part in his practice at Cleary Gottlieb. Where is that where you got to know Anna? I'm not no. sure. No, you didn't overlap. Okay. No. Um, where he represented clients in financial services and technology industries. Um, he is a contributor to The Conglomerate, a blog of six law professors on law, business, and economics, and the author of Law Bubbles and Financial Regulation. Anna is um, a professor at Georgetown and a fellow at the Peterson Institute. She was also at Cleary Gottlieb and at the Treasury Department from 1996 to 2002. As uh, you know, she writes on financial regulation, bankruptcy, sovereign debt, with Hal Scott, she's the author of International Finance. And I was just gonna throw all that out and say she's actually the queen of sovereign debt, and she throws great parties called DebtCon 1, 2, and now 3. 3, right? April 11th, 12th, come. in Washington. So oh. I will turn it over to them. Thank you. So thank you to Chris for having us. Um, it's a really great conference. Um, my apologies, this is supposed to be a round table, but uh, two of us are not here, and that leaves the two of us who are, so we will just keep rocking and then spinning around Anna. <laughs> I feel like I'm in Anna's orbit anyway, so. Um... It's a lazy Susan. Isn't okay. Um, so the, the idea behind this panel is to look at the democratic project of money. Um, from an informational lens. And the idea is uh, hopefully that looking at some of the lessons from uh, the economics of information and from information sciences is going to help, I think, clarify um, some of the challenges that um, we have from talking about money as a democratic project and also the necessity. So there's really gonna be three parts of my talk. The first is going to be using this informational lens to talk about what is problematic or what's hard about talking about making money more democratic. Um, the second part is going to be talking about how even if it's hard, it's necessary. You can't really deny uh, that money is a political project. Um, and I'll just tease, it's a little bit like Victorians and sex. The more you deny it, the worse it's going to get at some point later on. Um, I knew that would wake people up at five o'clock. Um, and the, the last uh, talk will be, um, the last part of the talk will be a little bit about some questions um, about what a democratic project of money would look like given some of these informational challenges. So let's start off by talking about what an informational lens means for looking at the democratic project of money. And if you start with money instruments themselves, um, Gary Gorton and his colleagues, whether you like them or not, um, I think have a pretty inf uh, helpful frame of looking at money claims and safe assets in terms of informational insensitivity. And what they mean by informational insensitivity are get contracts where you essentially don't have to do a lot of homework to figure out what the get contract is worth. Um, you don't have to do a lot of search costs to figure out what the value is. The volatility is pretty low, the liquidity is theoretically super high. Um, and the formal definition is get contracts that are immune to adverse selection and trading because agents have no desire to acquire private information about the current financial health of the issuer. Or at least that's one definition. So in many economic accounts by Gorton and others, money is the ultimate safe asset. Um, the upshot of this is whether you're creating money publicly or privately, um, the, the institutions that are creating money have to come up with devices or strategies to restrict the information content of money claims. Um, 
And this, um, in order, if you restrict em enough of the information content, then the people who are holding money don't have to invest a lot of um, uh, time or resources in figuring out what money is really worth. And tying in uh, some of the work that Anna and I did on safe assets, it's really law and legal institutions that are doing the work. It's legal institutions that are, are hiding information or um, economizing on information so that investors, market participants, other institutions don't have to um, invest time. Um, and I think what is important here for this particular project is that legal institutions are in part hiding information, not just providing it, but also restricting the information content uh, in what um, is provided to the market. Now, if you marry the idea of what information insensitive instruments look like on a micro level, you can marry that to theories about central bank independence and monetary institutions on a much larger level. Um, in part, um, the theories of remo having an independent central bank, removing a central bank from legislative control, is to restrict the information content of monetary policy. Um, it's not that there's no information there, it's outward facing that people are not, really don't have to do a lot of homework in terms of what monetary policy makers are doing. So part of the theory is um, dealing with dynamic inconsistency problems and political cycles in monetary policy and macroeconomic policy and masking or hiding a lot of the politics in central banking behind a technocratic facade. Um, it's a technical veneer that really um, hides a lot of deep normative and political trade-offs. Um, but the consistency, the theory again in central banking is if we can have a consistent um, information we uh, restricted set of rules, it can help shape expectations. And in modern uh, macroeconomic and monetary policy thinking, it's really expectations that are driving uh, monetary policy as much as the supply of money itself. I feel a little bit intimidated having you in the room, uh, Professor Tirolo, like since this is, I'm probably getting it all wrong, but. Um, uh, the, the alternative, um, if you don't have uh, use expectations to drive monetary policy, you have expectations sort of be in the driver's seat and uh, run monetary policy itself. So if you take this theory to its extreme, money becomes, a, uh, on a monetary policy level, a very mechanistic engineering project. You have things like the Taylor Rule that are very mechanical in how monetary policy is set. There's also, I think, an analogy to crypto or virtual currencies. So Bitcoin's formula or code for determining how many new coins are issued and when. Um, both policies and both communication strategies, um, Bitcoin and the Taylor rule, um, are supposed to be signing credi credible, are supposed to be creating credible apolitical commitments to live up to a particular uh, monetary policy. And um, it's not just a credible commitment of what um, interest rates are going to be, it's a credible commitment that monetary policy is going to be fundamentally apolitical. Um, and there's a whole set of legal institutions that we have that are designed to make this apolitical facade or this apolitical commitment um, realistic. Now, part of what I think um, where the inspiration from this talk came from um, is looking at and what marries the two um, parts of uh, looking at money, information and sensitivity, and a political commitment from monetary policymakers, is looking at lessons from computer science and property law. So Anna is going to talk a little bit about the uh, her little joke about what inspired Pierre and I to come up with this talk to begin with. Um, but the honest truth was Pierre and I were talking about what legal scholars we both liked uh, in common and the universe was pretty narrow. Uh, company excluded? Yeah. Um, so the, the idea is we both liked Henry Smith's work a lot. 
Um, and Henry Smith has done quite a bit of work in borrowing from information uh, sciences to, and applying that to property and contract law. So he writes a lot about information encapsulation, which is a concept from, uh, uh, from information theory in which it's not that when you're writing a computer program, it's not that the computer program isn't doing anything. Internally, the program is doing quite a bit. But externally, a, program, a coder or a user of a program is just looking at a particular computer programming or code module and doesn't really have to do a lot of work to figure out what the module does. This allows, um, uh, when you apply this sort of information hiding or information encapsulation, um, in computer programming, it allows modular programming. It allows things like object-oriented coding. When we're dealing with money, it allows money to become modular. Money um, can become a building block um, for other kinds of financial market transactions. So if you think about collateral for derivatives or the assets that go into complex securitization, if money is modular not only for finance, it's also, I think, modular for talking about politics and the polity, which I think is one of the great contributions of your work, Chris, is that money is more than just about finance. It's about the larger ways in which we're organizing um, our political project. Um, so what does this information lens do other than entertain Pierre and I over having beers? Um, I think it ties together the economic theories of money on a transactional level with an economic theory of money on a mo monetary policy level. It also, I think, focuses our attention more on what legal institutions are trying to do, which is, in part, hide information, not just reveal it. Um, it also, I think, ties together 20th century concepts of money and monetary policy with 21st concepts, 21st century concepts of algorithmic monetary policy and cryptocurrencies. But I think it raises a pretty big and fundamental challenge, and that is, it, can money and institutions of money be both democratic or be more democratic and consistent? Is it possible to have a more democratic uh, approach to money um, with one that meets these very deep demands of finance, financial markets? <laughs> All right, part two, Victorians and sex. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's hard to think about money in political terms. It certainly, there's a tension between what financial markets want and what uh, money can give. But um, money is inherently political. In fact, that's, I think, the big theme of this conference and many people's work in this conference. And the more you deny that there's political normative trade-offs in creating money and setting monetary policy and thinking about money, the more it's going to burst up at moments in which you don't necessarily, they're not the most productive moments. So the analogy that, um, that we draw here is Gary Gorton um, and his co-authors, when they talk about Insens informationally insensitive instruments. Part of their theory for the crisis is that the crisis really hits when these informationally insensitive instruments, these safe assets, these money-like claims, all of a sudden lose their information insensitivity. When all of a sudden market participants where they're holding debt claims, senior uh, asset-backed securities, worry about how much these things are really worth. Can we trust that they're really low credit risk, high liquidity, or do we have to sell them in a fire sale? Now, if a crisis causes money claims to lose its information and sensitivity, it also undermines that political or the myth that there's no political information content behind money creation. If the veil falls from money instruments, it also falls from the greater monetary project. All of a sudden, in a financial crisis, at least in a, fin a banking crisis, <coughs> people start to wonder, all of a sudden you see who's bailed out, who's not bailed out. You see who benefited from money and who didn't. And it's those moments that are particularly politically fraught. 
It's not like politics was never there all along. It's all of a sudden the green car curtain is pulled back and we realize just how political the entire system is. The problem is when you, sub when you deny money, you deny the politics of money, when it's actually revealed, it's not necessarily going to be the most productive con conversation. The consequences can be seismic. So let's talk about the final things, the, the pressing questions that I think in the informational lens raises. Um, the overview again is can you make money, can you have a conversation about making money more democratic um, while still hiding some of the messiness of the process? Can you have money that's more democratized while also maintaining some of the consistency that I think um, uh, financial markets are at least looking for? And it's a little difficult to pin down exactly what this means because um, democracy and co concepts like democracy and transparency are not self-executing terms. They mean many different things. They mean one thing to me and, and another uh, to Anna, and Anna's right. Um, uh, so based on the different kinds of forms that we can talk about making money more democratic or making the, the processes more transparent, based on the form they take, I think we have to ask whose interests are being served, whose interests are being ignored. Politics is not going away. They're still going to have someone whose ox is fattened and another person whose ox is gored, no matter what kind of political system we pick. Um, so I think there's three kinds of questions we have to ask. One is about access and allocation. Um, how does a central bank um, allocate credit? Um, and uh, Nagav is in the back there. I think your work is, is really fantastic, Nagav, on talking about the front end, about what uh, when central banks accept certain collateral for loans, that's about allocating credit. Morgan and Mercer are sitting right next to each other, which is convenient, so I don't have to go find them. Um, but but a part of what uh, the, the questions that both of your works raise is um, also about democratizing money and widening access to basic public credit institutions. And I think that there are some deep challenges, particularly for Morgan's proposal here. So Morgan is very um, careful not to um, talk about the politics of his proposal, um, in part, um, I think, because legal academics can they'll just want to talk about politics, and we're not very good about that. So I think it's a wise choice not to talk about the politics and central banking. I'm sorry, John, you're here too. Like, I'm ignoring. I, yeah. Keep, keep going. Um, John, uh, John and Morgan's work, um, though, I think is going to be inherently political, and that's, I think, part of the biggest challenge to having federal uh, access to federal bank accounts is the federal, uh, the federal Reserve Board. Um, I think is going to be very loath to really adopt your policy, uh, your, some of your policy proposals, because it really does. Uh, peel the veil back between how inherent, uh, inherently political um, some of these credit allocation decisions are. Um, uh, I think a, a second question, um, or a second category question of questions is about lifelines, right? Who is bailed out? Who has access to the discount window? Um, and who doesn't? Um, and this is something uh, that is very much, uh, I think, a helpful way of framing uh, Mian and Sufi's uh, work versus Ben Bernanke's work, right? Who gets bailed out? Uh, who has, uh, how do we deal with crises uh, at that moment in which the central bank is very, very political? There's also, I think, some pressing questions about governance, not just who sits on the board of governors. I'm all in favor of having more law professors uh, on the board. Um, but I think we could also ask some questions about e even uh, more immediate, realistic questions about um, who are the Class B and Class C directors on our Federal Reserve Banks, um, looking at the diversity among those directors among, along multiple dimensions. 
there's a real problem here, though, because there's a limited number of Class B and C directors, just as there's a limited number of people on the uh, Board of Governors. So they can never be representative in any true sense. Um, and expanding the boards of the Federal Reserve Banks, I think, is just going to limit their power. So there's a real tension between representativeness and uh, power of these institutions. Um, let me take a few postscripts and then I'll let Anna talk. The first is um, there's been a little bit of talk about cryptocurrencies and virtual currencies at the conference. Um, and at first blush, um, if you're a true believer and you've drank the Kool-Aid, the distributive ledger model seems to be in the, in the move, make a move towards democratizing money. But it really doesn't. Um, and there's a lot of fantastic work by fellows here at Harvard um, that talk about how virtual currencies are really just redistributing power to code and the authors of code. So Gay Filippi and Wright, who um, have a, a great book on blockchain and law, talk about this idea of Lex crypto Cryptography, no, whatever, Lex, Lex Cryptographica. It's not even real Latin anymore. Yeah, okay. Um, I didn't study Latin. Um, uh, the second postscript is, and I wish uh, my friend Pierre were here, and this is what he would have contributed, um, we could telescope outward and talk about the, how restricting the informa informational content of money, I think, points us to some interesting questions about ways in which other legal institutions outside of money also act to hide information in the theory or service of making things function more smoothly. And just as hiding information, hiding the political content of law can be quite explosive in money, I think that this same lens uh, or same metaphor applied to other areas of private and public law has some real benefits. So now, uh, now for something completely different. Um, so first of all, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nadav. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everyone uh, here. Thank so Chris, Nadav, and Susan, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for including us. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, and Susan, thank you, thank you, thank you for bearing with us. I'm not sure Susan is in this room, but I'm super grateful to her. And thank you to absolutely everybody in this room for sticking around, because that's completely heroic. Um, and um, I. Um, uh, so I came to this, first of all, it took me forever to get the Wizard of Oz reference. Um, and so I um, started thinking about Psycho, don't ask, um, which is a, um, a picture I use when I teach um, Glass-Steagall, like is it a wall or is it you know, a shower curtain with a lady standing behind it. And I didn't know that there was like visual consistency between that and the conference, the sort of the creepy version of the conference visual. So I apologize. I did not know. But I think that um, I guess I have a somewhat um, worried uh, attitude to what might be behind the curtain. And that may be one way for me to process that. Um, so um, this is really very much my saying that the thing that um, Eric and Pierre Schlag came up with when they were drinking in the bar in Colorado was actually super useful and um, can be a very, um, uh, to borrow from Chris, sort of a very generative um, frame for studying uh, this area, for talking about money and democracy, um, and partly because the minute I heard about it, I thought, well, gosh, it really brings up all kinds of disparate thoughts about, for example, my problems with government debt statistics. The fact that if you go on the BIS website and you like, try to find um, domestic debt securities for the United States, the United Kingdom, all the big rich economies, there's a giant big fat blank. Right? So half the table is blank, not because we don't collect the data, but because we don't collect it in the same way as, um, you know, uh, whatever, you know, Ecuador and Laos do. And so therefore, this information is just not there. And, and I just published a rant about how, of all the things you would think democratic accountability would require 
um, a fair amount of public debt disclosure, and that's exactly the opposite of what happens, right? Public debt has all these exemptions under securities law, and somehow nobody has any idea what their government owes and to whom, and that upset me. And the other thing that upsets me is that, you know, when I um, so just finished teaching banking, and I don't understand how it is that law students feel entirely comfortable and competent talking about things like search and seizure and global warming, which, by the way, the latter requires a whole bunch of, like, scientific knowledge to talk about sense, sensibly. But then when they look at banks, when you would give them a, a um, you know balance sheet with a bunch of one like 100, 10, you know very simple numbers, it was like whoa, you know this is somebody else's business. Let's, this is for the experts. This is not really something that American law students sort of feel comfortable um, engaging with. And I'm th and of course Adam Levitin and I keep saying this is the real constitutional law, guys. Like yes, some people get searched and seized more often than others, but all of you interact with the financial system 20 times a day, and this is literally constitutive of your lives. So this is constitutional, little c, big c, thanks to you know, Chris for um, framing it in that way, and yet we don't teach it that way, we don't understand it that way. And so I thought that um, this idea of kind of information encapsulation, information blocking, um, information access was actually quite useful to think about that. So I'll talk a bit about information forcing, information blocking. Um, I'll talk some about how I think these concepts work out in crisis and in post-crisis reform. And then I'll uh, talk about implications for one moment. Um, so the big insight, I think, that the frame um, contains is this tension between, on the one hand, the idea that democracy, and I'm thinking back to Anusha's presentation this morning, but at some level requires information flow. And this is a quote from an article of Vicki Jackson's that, you know, in order that consent of, in order for the consent of the government to be meaningful, there needs to be some transparency, right? There's just lots of talk about transparency and accountability. So it's about information provision versus this idea that money, safe assets, in order to be an effective transactional medium, it has to be information insensitive. It, the information shouldn't matter. It must be shut off um, for the payment medium to be effective. And so that raises to me the question, um, can money be democratic? Right? If democracy is about information flow, at some level at least, and if money is about shutting off information flow, um, if money itself must be a medium, it carries information about other things, but information about money um, is blocked in order for it to carry information um, about you know, transactions, goods, services, uh, whatever. Um, can money really ever be democratic? Um, so one uh, thing that their frame brought to mind was that actually we organize our, the economy um, and society to some extent in these um, very interesting ways. We have information intensive areas and then information insensitive areas, and near the two shall meet. Right? And you know, some of the ways in which folks have written about this, you know, so for example, securities, right? It's all about forcing information into the market. Um, banking, precisely the opposite. I mean, uh, Holmstrom wrote about this. Of course, Kate Judge adapted some of this in the law literature. Uh, banking is all about um, don't you worry about it. Don't ask what happens to your deposit. All you need to know is you get 100% you know, face value on demand. It's insured. Um, information blocking, information insensitive. Fiscal policy, this is what people in Congress yell about. This is why you know, there's the debt ceiling battles. This is why we're talking about the wall. Uh, this is all about, again, information in, um, intensiveness, information forcing. Um, monetary policy, quite the opposite. Behind closed doors, we're very careful about revealing information. Um, private debt, the domain of credit. Um, Covenant heavy, information intensive, public debt, I already mentioned, this is one of my pet peeves. Um, don't you worry your pretty head about it. I mean, there's actually some really interesting material on this. Um, for some reason, I was looking at Brandeis, I guess, and other people's money, and he was basically arguing that, look, 
um, municipalities can just go to market and like tell people all they need to know about their securities. And this is, it's a simple thing. It's not, um, there's not a lot of information to be had. You don't need banks to be processing this information. And if you look at a securities law textbook, you'll see that, you know, why is it that public debt is exempt from all kinds of disclosure requirements? You know, governments don't default and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this, you know, very um, stark separation between these, uh, these domains. And, you know, in the international uh, sphere, again, you've got, uh, you know, the sealed sort of universe of capital controls and then uh, uh, mobile capital flows. Um, again, what's interesting is, the, is that the way in which we organize ourselves um, seems to rely on there being an information intensive domain and an information insensitive domain. Um, and a lot of the proposals, so my friend Adam Levitin again was uh, you know, writing about full reserve banking and one of my concerns was he was creating you know, a bank with um, basically cash assets and cash liabilities so it's super safe, it's information insensitive. That means that a whole bunch of risk is going to this other domain, which is information intensive, right? Where information matters a whole huge lot. There's no risk in this one place. There's a ton of risk uh, somewhere else. And the, the entire picture depends on separation between the two. Now, what's interesting about um, what happens in crisis, and Eric already mentioned this, crisis is when all of these boundaries or a lot of these boundaries suddenly break down. Um, so all of a sudden, instead of uh, having uh, you know, securities and banking, and of course Morgan has written about this, you've got, gee, it turns out there are all kinds of money claims that are not in the banks. Right? So this boundary between information insensitive bank claim, uh, claims on banks and information intensive um, uh, securities markets instruments, that's, that blows up in your face, that's, that's gone. The boundary between fiscal and monetary policy blurs both uh, with emergency intervention and unconventional monetary policy. Um, the boundary between public and private debt um, blows up when we talk about when uh, you know when, with rescues or bailouts, whatever your nomenclature. And uh, again, on the international level. This is where you've got uh, you know, capital flight, currency collapse, these walls um, come down. And there are two things that are happening. Um, unveiling, meaning stuff we thought was separate actually is not. So this is something like shadow banking. And intervention, which is by res when we respond to the crisis, we break additional boundaries. So this is the emergency facilities, for example. Um, all right, after the crisis, um, we have to, if we're going to continue organizing the economy the way we do in these separate information intensive and information insensitive domains, um, you need to say, hey, you know, sorry guys, sorry public, we um, you know the separation wasn't quite what we thought it was, but don't worry about it, we can reestablish this order, we can restore order, in order to do that, um, we need public buy-in, right? And for that, um, we have this super information intensive kind of carnival moment where all of a sudden hierarchies collapse, information barriers collapse, there's this enormous flood of information um, that reminded me of, um, you know, some obscure literary theory to sort of talk about. Um, you know, this carnival moment, right? The, um, this is, an, uh, there's an enormous amount of theater surrounding kind of public political processing of the crisis that involves very visible breaking of these boundaries um, and, uh, you know, collapse of uh, hierarchies. And all of a sudden, everybody participates. You know, the veil drops from everybody's eyes and we all see the, kind of the sorted um, sort of sausage making enterprise. And then of course what happens after Tuesday, well then comes Wednesday and Lent. And having, after this information flow, after this information overload, 
um, you know, we return to austerity, re it enables re-encapsulation of information, um, but not until after um, something that seems like an information forcing period to which I'll return momentarily. So this is actually something that I, stumble on, I stumbled on a while ago. Um, you know, the PCORA hearings, which are held up as this um, wonderful civic moment, um, you know, at, at about the same time as Glass-Steagall um, was uh, being enacted, so boundaries are being uh, erected. Um, there, there's this just huge kind of massive public theater around, um, you know, finding the bad guys and, and sort of this is, you know, G, uh, this is, uh, Morgan, the, the son of the 1907 Morgan, he was testifying and somebody brought this really awful carnival dwarf to the hearings and then sort of had her sit on his lap. She's a performer and this was all over the papers. And then um, I guess when uh, uh, the public was cheering Pecora too loudly, Carter Glass was uh, got really upset and was saying that this carnival atmosphere is really unbecoming and all you need is, you know, peanuts and colored lemonade and, you know, this is just sort of, this is this kind of this moment that is held up as this democratic information discovery <coughs> moment has this incredible kind of theater component um, to it that I think was quite significant to um, how we processed the crisis. and. I mean, gosh, you know, going back, I didn't think about this, but going back to 2008, um, first of all, those were the good <coughs> days. There were two, not one, but two cold opens with featuring Tim Geithner. I mean, not the real Tim Geithner, but you know, this was the day when, uh, you know, talking about bank stress tests was worthy of Saturday Night Live. Um, this is when, you know, Hank Paulson there, uh, kneeled before Nancy Pelosi to try to get uh, TARP legislation passed. Um, we had all of these, not one, but four um, various inquiry commissions running simultaneously. And there's this idea that, look, um, and this is a memo from Davis Polk in the fall of 08, information is gonna come out, right? And information is coming out against the background of this, again, somewhat kind of um, louche carnival atmosphere. Um, now, what happens after that? After the information intensive moment, we have this information forcing period where, all right, we're gonna get our act together, we're going to, is what you really need to do, and this goes back to something Eric said, is uh, you need to reassure the public that um, money and other and whatever you decide is going to be information insensitive in this new world actually should be something that is none of the public's concern, right? It should pass from hand to hand, no questions asked. So the idea of information sensitivity is not that there is no private information, it's that private information doesn't matter, right? It's, it, so in terms of public ordering, it's about kind of organizing ourselves in a way that the public believes right, will reestablish some sort of a legitimate information and sensitive um, uh, transaction medium, among other things. So what we have is you know, a bunch of sort of structural reforms and capital reforms, and, but we also have this massive amount of information forcing. So we've got stress tests, and um, interestingly, there's some differences between the US and Europe that are instructive, and with results released to the public, and of course featured on Saturday Night Live again. There's resolution planning, something that has uh, also stuck with us. There's lots and lots of public and private reporting. The Federal Reserve, uh, the GAO has put out dozens of reports on the Fed. Um, there's you know, more private disclosure requirements, including as part of money market fund reform. Uh, there are new institutions, newly named institutions, so Office of Financial Research, Financial Stability Board internationally. There's this new genre, the Financial Stability Report, that is being put out by every investment, every, gosh, every central bank out there. There are peer assessments that are being published where, you know, uh, um, uh, financial, uh, financial authorities in different countries kind of review one another's policies. 
There are feasibility studies. So again, it's this massive flood of information. Um, and again, you wonder what is the effect of that? Kind of what is going to, what is that moment of information forcing? What is that period of information forcing going to do to our, to the kind of political constitution going forward? Um, what's interesting, and we're seeing a lot of this now, is that then it becomes a political game, right? Um, once we've established that everybody's in favor of transparency and more information is a good thing, that argument can be used strategically. So all of a sudden, the banks say, hey, the government needs to tell us how it's going to stress test us, right? So the burden of information production is going to be on the government. And the audience is the constituents are going to be financial institutions. Again, all in the name of transparency, just like all the uh, other stuff was. Um, you know, the audit, the Fed movement that uh, seems to have gotten another uh, sort of more energy behind it. Uh, recently, the, uh, this idea that the government should be um, producing more cost-benefit analysis on topics such as financial stability, you know, what is the cost of um, preventing the next financial cataclysm. It's sort of an interesting um, equation. Um, there is also a, um, a move to uh, kind of create these uh, institutions that uh, make information, certain information, easier to access. Um, all right. Um, now, what happens when crises happen over and over again? I mean, what's interesting, and that's totally an open question to my mind, is there a ratchet effect? Is there, so if we have another crisis, um, what good is a financial crisis inquiry commission going to be? How much of a, of a sort of, a, a, how much theater are you going to have to put on? Um, I mean, it's interesting to think about what the, all the various audits and inquiries post 2008 accomplished relative to, say, PCORA. Um, more disclosure, more volume, more complexity. Who's going to be processing this? I was looking at some financial stability reports. My God, there's a huge amount of information there. Is that useful from a democratic accountability standpoint? Um, and another thing that's happening, of course, is we're redesigning institutions. So, you know, Volcker Rule is sort of an interesting uh, example of that. We're re-encapsulating information. We're, we're changing the information units, if you will. Um, in Europe, it's even more interesting. You've got, um, you know, the European Banking Union as a means of breaking the bank sovereign vicious cycle. Um, so that becomes a new sort of information containing and information forcing unit as distinct from say national um, uh, banking sectors, national banking supervisors. Um, I won't dwell on this, but you know, sovereign bond backed securities in Europe, basically financial engineering to pool sovereignty in a way that's not um, uh, sort of publicly visible is also uh, an interesting example of re-encapsulation and re reconfiguring boundaries. All right, now this is um, what happens, one might argue, if you don't reestablish information and sensitivity. So this is um, uh, domestic deposits in Argentina, and the blue is foreign currency, right? So as soon as that, so basically, look, the population doesn't trust uh, its, uh, the, its government's money, and as soon as there's bad news, you know, people migrate into a different currency, and there's also their comparable charts for capital flight. So you could live in a world that is information intensive, um, it would be a much more volatile world, um, perhaps. Uh, and maybe there is no amount of sort of reassurance, no amount of information you can provide to uh, make it information insensitive. All right, um, so this is the end. Uh, descriptively, I think, um, 
you know, information and sensitivity is sort of, it's a, it's a construct, it's a model, it's a legal fiction or just a modeling fiction. Um, but operationally, it's a governance move. So separating these information intensive and information insensitive domains um, does a lot of work. Uh, because as uh, Eric was saying, somebody's writing the code, right? Information matters to somebody. Yes, it is true that the goal is for most people not to care. That's so that you know every time you pay for your cappuccino in U.S. dollars, nobody's looking up in a book how much is your dollar worth. Is it from a you know is it a, whatever is the note issued by a bank in the West or by a bank within two miles of here? It's a 19th century style. Um, but as part of creating these information intensive and information sensitive domains. Uh, you do entrench certain insiders. And the question is, does it matter? Is it inevitable? Um, and to the extent, if this ratchet hypothesis is right, does it lead to greater instability? Does it um, enhance power concentration in the long run? Is it politically problematic? And I have no idea what the answers to those questions are. So um, you're the round table. Let's talk. Thank you. Should we fill down a few Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I hope you know who you were. Um, <laughs> you're one, Anoush. Okay, that's great. I've been reading initially on the information stuff. I think it's useful to think with, but there's some stuff going on underneath the labeling of that um, that I'll try to get at. So I think that the black box is you know, the old information insensitive part of the loss is black putting it in the black box. And I think that certainly for money, black box is you know, as like you say. So it's a functional primary for money and with many social media. Um, so that part is inevitable. And private information doesn't matter but it doesn't matter on the assumption that someone's been giving you time. That's why it doesn't matter. It doesn't, mm -hmm. It's not that it doesn't matter in some transcendental sense. It just doesn't matter because the assumption is that there's been. Um, so I think that the, what we need to do, therefore, is with the process of black boxing, the network, but, but you can't change the outcome. It's going to have to be black box. Mm -hmm. But the process of making it black box, that's, that's where we can uh, put in some the times. And this comes down to this idea of a crisis, the crisis meaning when information, a crisis is when information insensitivity breaks down. And of course that's true, but why did it break down? It broke down the cards, it turns out that the process of black boxing was flawed. Mm -hmm. Because that which was unsafe was a bit safe. Uh, maybe in good faith, maybe in bad faith. Um, but there was a, but, but, but in some sense, the process of black box was flawed. It was unaccountable. Um, and what is this process of black boxing? Banking, it's acceptance. Um, mm -hmm. The bank accepts uh, some idiosyncratic violence. Whereas it's all, I all I, I, in some cases, it's all, in insurance, or if you're insuring a CEO, the, the AIG puts a AAA wrap on it and, and, and takes on the takes on the risk. So, in the sense that the black boxing is a process of socialization. It's, it's a brand, it's, it's making a particular gender, it's making the idiosyncratic socially legible, it's a minting process, if you want, from, from the point. In Marxist terms, it's, it's, it's the switch between concrete and abstract label. Um, this is a fraud. So there's an in principle reason why it ought to happen, but it's also a political process. Right? It's a fraud process that needs to be monitored, and, it, and I don't think it can be this kind of thing. It's just not And it strikes me that this information forcing period. Is, is the moment mm -hmm. when, when this process can be, and the structures of accountability that have broken down. I mean, we have a crisis because that process is bad. And, and now, again, inherent uncertainty in the system, when you're projecting certainly credit into the future, things will break down in good faith. The, the real breakdown, precipitating a crisis, suggests 
you know, that, that process is kind of uh, been amplified. Um, so that's how I would think about it. I think that the information, the, the information part is you, ha you have to have make an incentive. Mm -hmm. So the outcome is, is, is there. There's a process, that linting process, that black box of the process, mm -hmm. can be done in better or worse ways. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and the fidelity of that clearly in the industrial process was, was in there. Mm -hmm. Let's just take a couple of questions okay. and then, um, yeah. Um, yeah, this is amazing. I'm really excited this topic. It's so great to see this coordinated use of unpack beyond just the economic sense. Um, I don't know if this is off base or if this is not as different to what you're saying, and I'm just using my own language, so apologies if that's the case. But I really think, in addition to the information insensitivity and sensitivity um, dimension, to me there's also a kind of usefulness or non-usefulness of information. And I'm sort of thinking the kind of 200 brands of toothpaste kind of information. Um, and to me, a lot of that actually is a function of the technical design and monetary system decisions we're making. So if we make bad design, we can create a bunch of useless information. And then the question of whether we're suppressing that, is the act of suppressing that actually a form of monetary yeah. design improvement that is, is a net benefit? It's not a matter of making a political decision, it's fixing a prior political decision or improving upon it. And I think, for me, one of the things that Rick's, Morgan's proposal is so um, powerful is because it identifies a category of information that's functionally useless and a feature of a bad design in the first place. That the fact that there is an information discrepancy between, say, deposits and safe assets elsewhere, um, and, and saying, well, why do we want to waste all this time collecting, monitoring, allowing people to trade on this information? It doesn't have any useful social Function. This is the, this is you know 200 brands of toothpaste. It's really just one brand with 200 different trademarks. So we could take that logic, in my opinion, to the next phase with the broader public finance landscape because that's where safety actually means safety. That's where information insensitive does mean information insensitive in this narrow kind of global context. Yeah. So just some examples of that with the treasury market. You know you've got these different maturities, but they don't reflect information about the future. They reflect information about the different ways those asset categories are treated right now under monetary policy. And we're seeing that with the evolving central banking frameworks that include long-term interest rate targeting or quantitative easing or operational twists, things like that. We're not making predictions about 30 years in the future, we're making a prediction about the relative treatment of three-month debt versus 30-year debt by the central bank on a daily basis. That information could be provided a lot more simply by the central bank if there were certain political fictions that was willing to abandon and that information would therefore not be useful. I see similar things, for example, with the GSE markets, why we have a whole different set of information for mortgage-backed debt that is government guaranteed to treasury debt, when the two are functionally similar from all the purpose of the investor at the levels that it matters the most. Um, and you could imagine that across the public finance landscape, even down into the monetary policy decision you were talking about with Morgan's proposal, if we are guaranteeing collateral at some basic level, there is an information insensitivity in the monetary policy framework that's implicit if not explicit, and that actually may in turn be driving a bunch of other things in the act of Treating that as somehow sensitive information or useful is, is, a, is a fiction that's not doing us um, use. So I would sort of say, in my opinion, this, the second dimension is whether we want this information to exist or what the social purpose of gathering this information mm -hmm. is. And mm -hmm. I think that's a little, to me, a little different to just sensitive versus mm -hmm. sensitive. Um, yep. Uh, Pat, yeah. Oh, you're, sorry, you're, you're three? Okay. You're I don't know. You're keeping less. All right. I thought it was like everybody on this side and then everybody on that side. That that was my visual sort of yeah, recollection. Was, you know, right. Yeah. So all right. So but since I totally owe Pat for having done just this, so no, no, it's no, 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 you guys and then. All right. Yeah. There is a list. We're not going to tell you where you are on it. Yeah. All right. Um, well, it's round table. It's a lazy Susan, and then it goes this way. Yeah, it's a the, lazy season, um, Perry, until the, we get dizzy. Uh, well, like on a sh and in fact, like Rohan, I am not so keen on this concept of, of information sensitivity and safety. Um, I will say that I understand why, as voter economists, um, Gorton finds that a useful way to wedge in things that don't fit into the economics. Mm -hmm. of okay. I don't see why lawyers should <coughs> follow that path. Mm -hmm. um, although, of course, you have to engage with that, that discourse, so that, that, that makes sense. Um, and I do not intend to follow that path. Okay? And what, what Anish was suggesting was that to make something money, the key, the key uh, process is acceptance. Okay? And I wish to add my name to the list of people who believe that. Um, but let me say a little more about that. Just with a very concrete example, so that we have something, because this is sort of happening at this level of mm -hmm. abstraction. 
Um, what, what a, a very important uh, process, way in which law manufactured safe assets, mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll come back to how they weren't safe, in the shadow banking system, right. was to take something like a, uh, a risky individual mortgage, okay, homogenize it by securitizing it, you know, strip out the duration risk with some kind of interest rate swap, swip out, strip out the default risk with some kind of credit default swap, and what you wind up at the end is something you could arguably say is a synthetic treasury bill. Yeah. A synthetic treasury bill, three month treasury bill, just by stripping out all those other things with those other things. And then the market says, oh, that looks great. We don't have enough treasury bills, so let's treat this as if it's a treasury bill. And maybe it won't trade exactly like a treasury bill, but it'll be trading close to that. And it will function like that, and it flows around the system. And everything. Come the crisis, okay, the problem with these synthetic treasury bills is that your counterparty is not the government. Okay, your counterparty is all these goddamn people you've done swaps with. You know, and which it could be a lot, I mean, all that apparatus involves exposure to a million other people. Maybe the underlying assets were in fact fine, or there was a few subprime orders in there, but it wasn't that much, you know, but there's all these other exposures that you have created by creating this synthetic treasure bill, and now you have to worry, are they gonna default on me? What do their balance sheets look like? So it's not really about, it, it really is the issue of who is your counterpart. And that is not about safety and information sensitivity. We know exactly who those counterparties are. We just are scared of them, okay? And we would really like, you know what? I bought this thing because I wanted a treasury bill and I couldn't find one. Now, I really want a treasury bill and I'm willing to pay up for it. And that's what a crisis looks like. So the issue is really a counterparty issue, which is a very information intensive thing. Who exactly am I exposed to? And that becomes important at a certain time. And it's not so important in, in good times. And I'm willing to, to, to for, for money, I'm willing to take a little, a little risk there. Um, so the last thing about this. So the, if the key is your counterparty, how do you resolve a crisis? You resolve a crisis by making the government everyone's counterparty. You know, that's, that's what that is. You know, it's not making all the assets safe. It's just saying the government will buy them Okay, at this price, it will put a floor on. It will it will ensure them. It will you know. So that's what is happening: is that you're you're making the government everybody's counterparty, or enough you know to put a floor, a, a core set of assets. You know, you don't want to nationalize the whole thing. Although we kind of went pretty far down that road um, in this in this last crisis. Um, I think we talk about that. But so. I think that I'm just trying to unpack a few things for the lawyers and say maybe you don't maybe this information sensitivity kind of framing is 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 keeping you from understanding some things that you would understand more easily, okay, if you were thinking about it in this kind of way. So Perry, thank you. And I want to intervene just to make sure that the rest of this conversation is a little bit more informed of where we're coming from. Actually you just summarized our article called Inside Safe Assets. Um, so, um, and this is kind of how we come to this, right? Okay. What we say is, look, isn't it nice that Gordon and friends say there's this thing called information sensitivity, but it doesn't come, and this sort of, this gets me a lot of grief with people like Bruno Meyer and, and, and whatnot, right? Because they say, well, you know, safe assets are what you make safe, right? And this is partly what Eric and I are doing in that article is saying, look, um, you constitute your counterparties to be safe. And ultimately, it is the public backstop that makes them safe, right? And each of these links in the chain is a public or private legal link, right? So you could, you might have collateral, you might have guarantees, you might have seniority, right? There are all of these legal tools. So we have like a two-page table where we go through how does the law intervene to make certain things safe. And literally my favorite safety um, artifact, I suppose, is this beautiful letter from the treasurer of California, um, Bill Lockyer, arguing about HQLA, so high quality liquid assets, which is basically a list. And it sounds like it's a descriptor, right? It's, you know, there must be, they must be high quality and liquid. Well, the letter says by excluding, you know, by excluding muni debt 
from this category early on. You guys are killing California's ability to borrow, and you love Botswana more than you love California, and shame on you. Right? Which illustrates perfectly our point, which is that making something safe is a political project. And the only quibble, to the extent I have a quibble with um, sort of the, um, and I, I don't want to make it about sort of Morgan's and John's proposal or project is that when you say something, or what Anoush just said, when you say something is socialized, that's the beginning of the conversation. It's not the end of the conversation. The question is, how do you, all right, so in the end, the state is your counterparty. Unless you live in a hermetically closed, dictatorial, sealed economy, how you interact with the state and is, is, is a contested, you know, sort of voice exit and all that question. So you need to, if you're going to say the government is going to guarantee or the Fed is going to be open to the people, then I want to hear how, right? I want to hear where's the money going to come from, where's the political support going to come from, what is the mechanism going to be, which is why Chris's work is so valuable in that respect. So I think we completely agree with where you guys are coming from. And I think, but what, it's useful to see that however artificial, it is stunning that we configure our financial system to segregate the insured, state-backed, um, quote-unquote, information insensitive, or don't you worry your pretty head about your Bank of America deposit, because it's not, it doesn't matter, from the, wow, here's 500 pounds of SEC disclosure securities markets, right? And it's a choice. It's, a, it's sort of, it's a complete, it's not given, it's normative. It's, it's a choice both to do the separation and to do it the way we do. And that, I think, is something that is worth, A, asking whether we need to. And I think Anusha's point is we probably do, it's inevitable. But then, you know, um, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Um, why we choose this, how this works, I mean, there's the, um, you know, the suppressing useless information, well, I'd like to know who does it and on what criteria, right? I mean, who decides that it's useless? I mean, obviously I can't process everything, but, you know, I feel a lot better if um, there were a governance dimension to this useful, useless business. So I think Chris was next. So can I, because I feel so Yes. Good. So I I find the whole the polarity or the framework created by Gordon misleading, right? It's not. That was my point. Yeah. 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 And it's yeah. Totally. So I don't want to use those words. Yeah. Say, right, say right. Right. So, so in, in part of my question is, you know, why are you guys working with that term when it actually seems like, you know, what he took was sort of a byproduct of of money making stuff that looked like money for me. Reified into into a virtue, right? Information insensitivity or restricting information. Whereas, if you actually look at why money is safe, it's not because there, it's it's not even because the information is sensitive, except in a very careful way that when you said, you know, there's not uh, an advantage to private investigation. It's that everyone has the same information, and that it's that the state is your counterpart. You put it in, in Harry's way, but to put it my way, it's there's a fiscal anchor and there's cash a cash premium and we know about those things and in each each kind of money that I've looked at those things are actually fairly transparent right so it's transparent in the case of fiat money what the what the fiscal situation is you know sometimes the state's going down up who's going to save your money then it was coin they didn't actually give out information about what the content was they gave out information about what the price of the mint was therefore the price of silver became you knew the prices in the market, so you knew what it, whether, whether you knew how many points you were going to back, so you knew whether it was worth going to the mint, right? Um, because all the information they were giving you was the relevant stuff domestically. You could play with the gold content, right. with Russian's law. But same with banking. The reason it's information, the reason it's safe is because it's guaranteed. <laughs> so, so I, and I don't even think that's more fun. I think it's, I think it's misleading to think. That all kind of trans it sort of implies that all mystification and transparency are the same and that they're always opposed. 
No, it's certain kinds of information that are creating a safe asset, as in your article. And, and in this case, that information is created by a certain counterparty, which is the government. So I just don't think Wharton, I think he's um, creating a fiction that we should not, that we should be very careful about. I, I think he's set, setting up in some ways a false polarity here. Uh, so so I'm, I'm going to try to create a bridge between this contingent and this contingent and that, that by great peril, <coughs> which is, is when I think about the idea of private label mortgage-backed securities and CDOs as being informationally insensitive, it's preposterous. It, in, in retrospect, it's absolutely preposterous. But that whole project of private label securitization was a project to create the appearance of information right. sensitivity. And here I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. It was actually the senior tranches for an attempt to gain distance from counterparty exposure through, through the, you know, credit enhancements <coughs> and, and senior claims and very short payouts, et cetera. Um, and to, and to, to, especially with the very short payouts, to, to create a sense of, of money. Um, so where I'm headed with this is when I look at the private label mortgage-backed securities market, what is astonishing to me is it's dead. It never revived. In 2008, mortgage financing essentially became a U.S. government financing vehicle, and it is dominated by that, and we see no way out. So this, this was a different path. We, we did not re-encapsulate it. We just shifted it over, over to the government as we had to do. Now, the, the quandary here, or the paradox is, why, so we know the other private label asset-backed securities markets did temporarily collapse in the fall of 2008, but they, they eventually got back on their feet, credit cards and car loans, all this sort of stuff. So are they, are, are they imposters or not? And I can't answer that question. Why, why did mortgage get back on its feet for the rest of the so I think you had your hand up, and then um, Katarina. Okay, so, sir, then Katarina, then Morgan, then Mirsa, then Nadav. Okay. Well, I confess I'm very much an outsider to this conversation, and uh, but listening in, it seemed to me, Anna, that you you very compellingly worked from a historical understanding to generate a structural logic. To that, a structural logic. And in the course of our conversation, the questions that are emerging is, well, where does a structure come from? Right. And how might a structure be changed? Uh, and so I take um, Chris's uh, comment as a sort of call, let's go back to the historical specificity here, mm -hmm. because, you know, 19, the example, of, I guess it was 1933, uh, obviously there's a historical difference there as well. So. This isn't a, a hard question, but what's gained from the kind of structural uh, analysis that you gave us, which I really liked, I mean, clarified a great deal for me. Uh, and yes, um, how does that then force us to ask really hard questions about how a structure has changed and uh, where a structure comes from? Absolutely. Okay. So, um, was it Katerina, Morgan, Mersa, Anush? So, so I basically, I, I was also puzzled by the framing um, uh, because I think, you know, if you use information, uh, which is also very often used in financial markets and, and maybe also for democracy, but, but you know, one would also think about hierarchy. So if you pose yeah. the entire question, you know, if, if finance, finance is inherently a hierarchical, as Carrie has also argued, I think mm -hmm. that's why it can be revealed through the structures, the securitization structures, then the, also the question that comes up, can that be possible? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just wondering why you use this information um, um, lens to look at that. And, and I was also like, you know, I, 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 you said something here to agree completely with Perry, but, but Eric was saying in his, in his presentation, you know, the market demands information um, in sense 
And it was Pat's right. point as well, yeah. Right. So it's not so certain types of private debt was also sense always sensitive, but certain things we make insensitive that it looks like government money, but it's really, I think, shift changing the hierarchical nature mm -hmm. of these assets by basically allowing you to conduct a little crime against the state. So I'm, I'm just sort of and again I think so when I think folks uh, about about structure in terms of hierarchy <laughs> rather than, than information on the choice of why you choose one over the other when both actually sort of would um, and I think it's going to hire a question, so much, close, much prior questions about the relationship between crime. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, Morgan. Well, I'm going to draw a distinction, so this will dovetail with something that kind of been a little bit of a little bit more specificity. And also, what I'm about to say, I may have already said to you guys five times over the years, and I'm sorry, but there's a distinction I think is really essential here between safe assets or informational informationally insensitive assets on the one hand and money claims on the other hand. And, and, and I'm going to do this a little differently from Chris, however. So, so in the Gorton world, safe asset means very, very low credit risk or perceived very, very low credit risk. Uh, uh, and so that would, would include AAA, CEO, Trojan, et cetera. Uh, uh, money that's, however, requires also, in my view, or at least uh, to use the term useful, requires also very low interest rate risk. So it's inherently a very short-term debt. And, 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 and you know, if you have very low credit risk and very low interest rate risk, you have a very stable value in novel terms. And that stable value, and so in a world I think of sticky prices, it's easy to rationalize special demand for something that has very stable value in novel terms. Uh, so the court, what support has always been a little unclear about this, right? In the original Gordon Panaki model had nothing to do with duration and all about credit risk. And he still talks about it mostly that way, like short-term yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's a little, little more information it's just a little more so. But he doesn't draw, uh, uh, duration really isn't a part of that story. Whereas if you look at Jerry Stein's or uh, moneyness and looking at the way it's in the treasury yield curve, it sets in at about six months, right? You know, six months and inward in terms of duration. Zero to six. Zero to six. But, and yeah. I, I mean six, yeah, zero to six, right? Or zero mm -hmm. to nine months, maybe. It's yeah. down to 10 basic points of what he calls moneyness at six months. At 60 basis points mm -hmm. in one week. So it's, it's virtually gone in a year. And it's no coincidence mm -hmm. that the term near money has always been short term. Mm -hmm. Cash equivalents for accounting for accounts has always been three months of uh, The term money market traditionally mm -hmm. is a year duration. And so this duration aspect of money is, is just extremely important. And you can see it. And I, I think that distinction, the conflation, as I see it, and maybe you're not mentally conflating it, but Smushing together that with safe assets to me misses something really important. And the distinction is really, is really, in Stein's world, it's like a phase transition, right? So mm -hmm. uh, between a liquid and a gas. And, and, and mm -hmm. it's in, I've looked at, I'm not, I'm not a physicist, but I'm looking at my side, but it turns out there's an intermediate phase right. between liquid and gas called a supercritical fluid. And it has mm -hmm. some of the features of <laughs> liquid and some of the gas. It also can be dialed a little yeah. more toward one or the other, right? Looks and, like and goop it between the liquids. Permeability and whether, it's, and whether it's solvent and whether it has surface tension and all these things. And so, and, and so but it's dialed. But it, it, it's this very narrow range in which you see that. I think I sort of think of the of moneyness as being the super so non-actual medium of exchange things that we should call money are are the super critical fluid and it really, really matters when you talk about duration and conservation is really important. It's also liberating because it's identifiable with a very, very specific funding model. Mm -hmm. Very historically specific funding model, issuing a bunch of this stuff on financial yeah. reserves and rolling it over the so whether that's repo right. or whether it's deposits or whether it's Banknotes, it always looks the same. Which means, I, I think, and this is where I talk a lot, of it, is that we can define it and confine this activity and say, no, that, that is money creep. Right? CDOs, it, you know, it's interesting whether we have this information on sensitive or safe assets or whatever, but that to me, in and of itself, it's not useful to use words like money in this information. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, very different regulatory uh, problem. And I'll just say one final thing. Yeah. The crisis, right? I mean, in Gordon's world, 
informationally insensitive becomes information sensitive, and that's what he means by information. Very, very clear. Right. Uh, but when did that happen in the recent crisis? I would say that moment was mid 2007. Right. Uh, yeah. Like August 2007. And, and granted, we did enter a like, pretty mild recession in December. And then when there was a real run on money for the Lambda in mm -hmm. September of 2008, the character of the recession changed on a dime. Mm -hmm. It became a free fall. Mm -hmm. It became just an acute macroeconomic disaster at that particular moment. There's another reason I think it's important to draw the distinctions from a policy standpoint. When we smush all these things together and look at the crisis as this, and I'm not suggesting really that you're doing this, but I'm, I'm trying to draw a system that was not, was not present in your presentation. And, These things all go together with a very, very specific funding model. I just think it's important to be very specific mm -hmm. about that. And it's liberating because it allows us to see regulatory alternatives that we otherwise not. Mm -hmm. um, I think Marissa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I want to see if there's a tie to the story that you were talking about on Kim's mission. So, um, so one of the things I think, uh, just if you, Look at the information regime. I think that there's also a moment in time, let's say, during the deregulatory era, where we will start to talk about information disclosure as a method of sort of um, uh, regulation or as a stand in for other things. And, and so I wonder, I'm mean, going back to sort of democracy, I mean, the difference between authoritarians and you know, even like your, you know, um, William Jennings mm -hmm. Bryan Cross Gold or, um, you know, post Great Depression, New Deal era stuff, you know, um, the the thing that's missing in this crisis versus that one is not the information necessarily. I, mean, I don't think that, the, I think everyone's right that the information is, is sort of not all created equal, but that there was no narrator, but there wasn't a, 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 a story told by a different level of politics to allow for the democratic system to be involved at all. And so if you look at, you know, who's after we talked about the New Deal being sort of like this revision of the Constitution, we, we never had that moment, and whether that's because well, I think we actually did, and it, it was Rick uh, Santorelli or whatever his name is. Like, it was his story that caught fire, not... Right. So that void is filled by Rick Santorelli and, like, the, the cranks, right, who are gold standard, Bitcoin, um, the anti-Semitism that's revived now with the Federal Reserve. You have the, the, the void being filled on the left with some other, you know, stuff, mostly on the right. But, I mean, looking at the sort of popular culture and looking at my students, the way that they want to see this crisis is the big short. I don't know, I, I have mixed feelings about it, but at the end, you know, they, they kind of have this thing, oh, then the bankers went to jail, and we blah, blah, blah. That's that's the thing that sticks at them, is like nobody went to jail, right? Um, and then, you know, even the SNL, the stress testing, which I always show every year to my class, right? That That is the popular culture narrative, is that everyone passes, we don't know what happened, but it was sort of like pass, pass, uh, the system sort of you know, protected the banks and nobody, it's, it's this black box. And so, so, I think, so I think that void has been filled and then belatedly um, what turned it, what went from an information crisis or call it whatever you will into a political crisis. And I think the void is now being filled by all across, right? It's a I mean, Adam Tews' book, Crash, talks about how he, he traces sort of the financial crisis into kind of as it, as it ricochets around um, the Eurozone and it turns into a political crisis. <laughs> Um, um, so you haven't spoken before, so you go. And then everybody who's spoken before gets to, and, and if you have rotten vegetables, you can throw them at them. <laughs> um, now is the time. Uh, in the conversations, I, I think the, uh, there is like a wish to put a divide and to, to have a binary vision of what is information sensitivity and what's not, mm -hmm. trying to find safe assets and to get to money and so on, but I would rather see that in a, a, all the degrees, nothing binary. Okay. And, and we, something I didn't hear is about the mispricing of risks, it, is the story we tell about the, uh, um, the, uh, how the assets were, were priced, and <laughs> there was indeed a wish for black and white acceptance mm -hmm. of what is risk free and what is not. But mm -hmm. that's just the oversimplification of the markets. 
the market trader was more not to have correct pricing of risk with different degrees of equal scale. Mm -hmm. And if, if, even for the trial of having the risk free assets, there, as Marcus Bergemeyer was also said, is, uh, there is no, um, it's what you want to name as a risk free asset, but at some point, mm -hmm. uh, money can lose its function and mm -hmm. money less is no longer there and then we turn to that monetary system. So there it's a whole continuity, not so much a curtain, and the curtain is just done by uh, the always simple the wish to simplify everything or get to mm -hmm. simplistic view of things. Mm -hmm. can, can I respond to that? Yes. So I think part of the gaps that we're going here is that we don't believe in the divide. But the belief in the divide is real, yeah, right? That's and that's that's what's dangerous. Um, and I think that I think we get a better job in our safe assets paper of explaining how it's the legal fiction or the market fiction. It's out there, but that sort of what when you treat a continuum of risk instead, uh, when you treat a continuum of risk as something discontinuous, like discontinuous, where there's all of a sudden safety and then there's not safety, that's what. That's it's dangerous. I think what's dangerous. And I think to, to, um, we also get a better job in our um, article of addressing uh, Morgan's point. Not all safe assets are money. Um, I think what's interesting here is that a lot of the safe assets are kind of like money derivatives. They have some of the characteristics of money, but very few of them have all of what most economists think of as money. And like if you talk about repo or maybe asset that commercial paper, that's probably got more of the, the characteristics of money, including the shorter duration that you're talking about. One of the things I think I liked most about our earlier paper, since that's obviously more successful. Why are you ditching this new idea of yours? Well, because I think <laughs> this is a different project. I'm, I'm going to get uh, like I think a response to our our disbelievers. Oh. One of the favorite things that I liked about our earlier paper is. I can't remember which article we did it in, but we had that pyramid, right? Yeah. Of yeah, how public assets, or the pyramid of public safe assets that ultimately were used to create pri private safe assets. And then if you look at the way that the crisis broke out, it wasn't, there were certainly very big and sharp jumps, but if you look at it, um, the, the way the crisis broke out, it was the further out private safe assets, the, that, that, that really, um, those markets collapsed first. And then it started raveling back into corporate debt. And ultimately, it, it affected sovereign debt too, right? So not all sovereigns are created equal. Um, I completely agree with you that ultimately, at the, the base of the pyramid is sovereign debt, but Iceland, Greece, um, some sovereigns were affected a lot, uh, were affected before. Uh, right, we I were. mean, and then you do the capital controls on it, but. Well, I mean, Perry's got this whole hierarchy, right, thing worked out, which is, I think, which makes a huge amount of sense. And by the way, like, why don't we deal with hierarchy? Because other people <laughs> deal with it really nicely. and. I don't like mentioning Gorton's name for two reasons. One is that he's not the only one writing about safe assets and, and he's not even, to my mind, the most compelling on the point. Um, and two is that, you know, like I, I don't care about picking a fight with him, but in, in, information and sensitivity is baked into a lot of models and it has somehow migrated from model talk to this very real social institution that is sort of has reified a bunch of gunk in a way that is very unself-conscious and has tremendous governance implications. And so, like to Morgan's point on duration, like it's just we're we're worried about two completely different things. You're worried about runs, and I think if you're worried about runs, you're massively worried <coughs> duration. And and so I'm not one of those people who says the construct doesn't work. I just want to know more about what you do with the government part of it because of course in my world it's not 
US and reserve asset. It's all that my world is all about Greece, right? So that's where I think. So if you're worried about runs, you're worried about duration. If you're worried about what role does the law play in making it possible for all of these market participants to act as if this gunk is safe, right? Then you're not just, then you're looking at much more of a continuum and maybe money is <coughs> the safest because it's both credit and duration and, you know, sort of there's liquidity, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's credit, there's foreign exchange, there's all of that, right? And then at the other extreme, you know, then you can go all the way down to basically credit, you know, like risky junk and then you figure out where you draw the line and the line obviously moves with macro conditions. Um, and it's, you know, we have a problem with the discontinuity and we, think, and we think it's just hugely about the law and governance. That's what we're worried about. We're worried about the fact that somebody says, oh, don't you worry, you're pretty head about it, it's safe. Why? Because the state is behind it. Well, how exactly, right? I mean, it's, it's a nifty thing that FDIC signs say full faith and credit, but it's not actually strictly a U.S. government obligation. It's authority to borrow. Does it matter? I submit that in some universe it might. Right? And this is the level at which a lot of this stuff is actually being worked out. And I think that's, like, we're just sort of like little lawyers, right? I mean, we're, we're not trying to do economics. We're trying to say, gee, there's a whole bunch of very concrete, tooly stuff. So can I be a little bit more? And then um, we're going to end, yeah, okay. because I'm a jerk and so, I'm um, I, I don't think it's completely... I mean, I think there's something worthwhile in the informationally insensitive literature, and I realize that Gorton is is partially providing an apology for credit derivatives and securitization and companies that he used to work for. Um, uh, well, well, well. Um, but I still think that there's something there, even if um, we're not on board with justifying the private label mortgage-backed securities or CDO market. And I, I think there is something about how much information people are demanding and when they're demanding information. And, of, and who is, like, so to me, it's just the height of cynicism that this call for transparency and information production has somehow morphed from, um, you know, cough up information about all these crappy CDS and CDOs to government turn over your models for, um, you know, stress tests. I think it's a political move. Which is why sometimes obesity, to quote the uh, title of one Perry's own paper, obesity is sometimes the response. Yes, I did read it. Because uh, yeah. you don't want to play with a hand of poker. Uh -huh. Aha, right. Showing, showing your cards. If you're, if you're telling the price at which ex ante you're going to pay them your account, Right, right. You right, totally. Bad, bad just, actually, yeah. And that's a wonderful, oh my God, we should have a symposium volume and you should say mm -hmm. democratic capacity. Um, can we, yeah, we should, yeah, we should. But, but the folks who spoke before, thank you. And can we talk on the side afterwards? So thank you so much. Thank you. There were only two.